make a damn schedule and stick to it. Okay, so what's the rule with the schedule? It's not a bloody prison. That's the first thing that people do wrong. They say, well, I don't like to have, follow a schedule. Well, it's like, well, what kind of schedule are you setting up? Well, I, sh I have to do this, then I have to do this, then I have to do this, you know, and then I just go play video games because who wants to do all these things that I have to do? It's like wrong. Set the damn schedule up so that you have the day you want. That's the trick. It's like, okay, I've got tomorrow. If I was going to set it up so it was the best possible day I could have, practically speaking, what would it look like? Well, then you schedule that. And obviously, there's a bit of responsibility that's going to go along with that. Because if you have any sense, one of the things that you're going to insist upon is that at the end of the day, you're not in worse shape than you were that, than at the beginning of the day, right? Because that's a stupid day. If you have a bunch of those in a row, you just dig, you know, you dig yourself a hole and then you bury yourself in it. It's like, sorry, that's just not a good strategy. It's a bad strategy. So maybe 20% of your day has to be responsibility and obligation, or maybe it's more than that, depending on how far behind you are. But even that, you can, you can ask yourself, okay, well, I've got these responsibilities. I have to schedule the damn things in. What's the right ratio of responsibility to reward? And you can ask yourself that just like you'd negotiate with someone who is working for you. It's like, okay, you got to work tomorrow. Okay, so I want you to work tomorrow. And you might say, okay, well, what are you going to do for me that makes it likely that I'll work for you? Well, you could ask yourself that, you know, so maybe you do an hour of, of responsibility and then you play a video game for 15 minutes. I don't know, whatever turns your crank, man. But, you know, you have to negotiate with yourself and not tyrannize yourself like you're negotiating with someone that you care for, that you would like to be productive and have a good life. And, and that's how you make the schedule. It's like and then you look at the day and you think, well, if I had that day, that'd be good. Great. You know, and you, you're useless and horrible, so you'll probably only hit it with about 70% accuracy, but that beats the hell out of zero, right? And if you hit it even with 50% accuracy, another rule is, well, aim for 51% the next week, or 50.5% for God's sake, or because you're, you're going to hit that position where things start to loop back positively and spiral you upward. Stop doing the things that you know are wrong that you could stop doing. Right? So it's, it's, a fairly, it's a fairly limited attempt. First of all, we're not going to say that you know what the good is or what the truth is in any ultimate sense. But we will presume that there are things that you're doing that for one reason or another you know are not in your best interests. There's something about them that you just know you should stop. They're kind of self-evident to you. Other things you're going to be doubtful about. You're not going to know which way is up and which way is down. But there are things that you're doing that you know you shouldn't do. Now, some of those you won't stop doing for whatever reason. You don't have the discipline, or maybe there's a secondary payoff, or you don't believe it's necessary, or it's too much of a sacrifice, or you're angry or resentful or, or afraid. Who knows? So forget about those for now. But there's another subset that you could stop doing. It might be a little thing. Well, that's fine. Stop doing it and see what happens. And what will happen is your vision will clear a little bit. And then something else will pop up in your field of apprehension that you will also know you should stop doing and that you could stop doing because you strengthened yourself a bit by stopping doing the particular stupid thing that you were doing before. That just puts you together a little bit more. And you could do that repeatedly for, for an indefinite period of time. And, and, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to ever be able to formulate a clear and final picture of what constitutes the truth and the good. But it does mean that You'll be able to continually move away from what's untruth and what's bad. And, you know, that's not a bad start. You know, I'll, I can't sleep at night because I'm thinking about something. And usually what I'll do is go write it down. I have some writing to do. So I get up and I go write down what I'm thinking. And that usually does the trick. But because I had been playing with YouTube, I thought, well, I'll try making YouTube video and, and telling people what I'm thinking about and, and see if that performs the same uh, function as writing. And to me, the function of writing, well, it's twofold. One is conceivably to communicate with people, although the fundamental purpose for me is to clarify my thoughts so that I know, to, you know, because if, you're, if something is disturbing you, what that means is that it needs to be 
articulated it what it's the emergence of unexplored territory something that disturbs you that that's the right way to think about it it's unmapped territory that's manifesting itself it's like a vista of threat and possibility and you need to articulate a path through it and so that's what i was doing it's like i was thinking well this is bothering me and this seems to be why and here's what i think is going on and and so i made the videos and in some sense i i didn't think anything more of it you don't have to necessarily have done anything wrong for things to get completely out of control. It's a terrifying doctrine, but it's not a hopeless doctrine because it still says that there's a way forward, there's a pathway forward, and the pathway forward is to adopt a mode of being that has some nobility so that you can tolerate yourself and perhaps even have some respect for yourself as someone who's capable of standing up in the face of that terrible vulnerability and suffering and that the pathway forward as far as the existentialists are concerned is by, well certainly by the avoidance of deceit, particularly in language, but also by the adoption of responsibility for the conditions of existence and some attempt on your part to actually rectify them. And the thing that's so interesting about that is, well two as far as I'm concerned, and some of this is from clinical experience. You know, if you take people, and I've told you this, and you expose them voluntarily to things that they are avoiding and are afraid of, you know, that they know they need to overcome in order to meet their goals, their self-defined goals. If you can teach people to stand up in the face of the things they're afraid of, they get stronger. And you don't know what the upper limits to that are, because you might ask yourself, like, if for 10 years, if you didn't avoid doing what you knew you needed to do, by, the def by your own definitions, right, within the value structure that you've created to the degree that you've done that, what would you be like? Well, you know, there are remarkable people who come into the world from time to time, and there are people who do find out over decades long periods what they could be like if they were who they were, if they said, if they spoke their being forward. And they get stronger and stronger and stronger, and we don't know the limits to that. We do not know the limits to that. And so you could say, well, in part, perhaps the reason that you're suffering unbearably can be left at your feet, because you're not everything you could be, and you know it. And of course, that's a terrible thing to admit, and it's a terrible thing to consider, but there's real promise in it, right? Because it means that perhaps there's another way that you could look at the world and number, another way that you could act in the world. So what it would reflect back to you would be much better than what it reflects back to you now. My experience is with people that we're probably running at about 51% of our capacity. Something, I mean, you can think about this yourselves. I often ask undergraduates, how many hours a day you waste or how many hours a week you waste? And the classic answer is something like four to six hours a day. You know, inefficient studying, uh, watching things on YouTube that not only do you not want to watch, that you don't even care about, that make you feel horrible about watching after you're done, that's probably four hours right there. You know, and you think, well, that's 20, 25 hours a week, it's 100 hours a month, that's two and a half full work weeks, it's half a year of work weeks per year. And if your time is worth $20 an hour, which is a radical underestimate, it's probably more like 50, if you think about it in terms of deferred wages, if you're wasting 20 hours a week, you're wasting $50,000 a year. And you are doing that right now. And it's because you're young, wasting $50,000 a year is a way bigger catastrophe than it would be for me to waste it because I'm not gonna last nearly as long. And so if your life isn't everything it could be, you could ask yourself, well, what would happen if you just stopped wasting the opportunities that are in front of you? You'd be, who knows how much more efficient, 10 times more efficient, 20 times more efficient. That's the Pareto distribution. You have no idea how efficient, efficient people get. It's completely, it's off the charts. Well, and if we all got our act together collectively and stop making things worse, because that's another thing people do all the time, not only do they not do what they should to make things better, they actively attempt to make things worse because they're spiteful or resentful or arrogant or deceitful or, or homicidal or genocidal or all of those things all bundled together in an absolutely pathological package. If people stopped really, really trying just to make things worse, we have no idea how much better they would get just because of that. So there's this weird dynamic that's part of the existential system of ideas between human vulnerability, social judgment, both of which are, 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 are major causes of suffering, and the failure of individuals to adopt the responsibility that they know they should adopt 
It isn't merely that your fate depends on whether or not you get your act together and to what degree you decide that you're going to live out your own genuine being. It isn't only your fate. It's the fate of everyone that you're networked with. And so, you know, you think, well, there's 9 billion, 7 billion people in the world. We're going to peak at about 9 billion, by the way, and then it'll decline rapidly. But 7 billion people in the world, and who are you? You're just one little dust moat among that 7 billion. And so it really doesn't matter what you do or don't do, but that's simply not the case. It's the wrong model, because you're at the center of a network. You're a node in a network. Of course, that's even more true now that we have social media. You'll, you know, you'll know a thousand people at least over the course of your life. And they'll know a thousand people each. And that puts you one person away from a million and two persons away from a billion. And so that's how you're connected. And the things you do, they're like dropping a stone in a pond. The ripples move outward and they affect things in ways that you can't fully comprehend. And it means that the things that you do and that you don't do are far more important than you think. And so if you act that way, of course, the terror of realizing that is that it actually starts to matter what you do. And you might say, well, that's better than living a meaningless existence. It's better for it to matter. But I mean, if you really asked yourself, would you be so sure if you had the choice? I can live with no responsibility whatsoever. The price I pay is that nothing matters. Or I can reverse it and everything matters. But I have to take the responsibility that's associated with that. It's not so obvious to me that people would take the meaningful path. You know, when you say, well, nihilists suffer dreadfully because there's no meaning in their life and they still suffer. Yeah, but the advantage is they have no responsibility. So that's the payoff. And I actually think that's the motivation. Say, well, I can't help being nihilistic. All my belief systems have collapsed. It's like, yeah, maybe. Maybe you've just allowed them to collapse because it's a hell of a lot easier than acting them out. And the price you pay is some meaningless suffering, but you can always whine about that and people will feel sorry for you. And you have the option of taking the pathway of the martyr. So that's a pretty good deal, all things considered, especially when the, when the alternative is to bear your burden properly and to live forthrightly in the world. Well, what Solzhenitsyn figured out, and so many people in the 20th century, it's not just him, even though he's the best example, is that if you live a pathological life, you pathologize your society. And if enough people do that, then it's hell. Really, really. And you can read the Gulag Archipelago if you have the fortitude to do that, and you'll see exactly what hell is like. And then you can decide if that's a place you'd like to visit, or even more importantly, if it's a, light, if it's a place you'd like to visit and take all your family and friends, because that's what happened in the 20th century. I started to pay very careful attention to what I was saying. I don't know if that happened voluntarily or involuntarily, but I could feel a sort of split developing in my psyche and the split. And I've actually had students tell me the same thing that has happened to them after they've listened to some of the material that, that I've been describing to all of you. But I split into two, let's say. And one part was the, let's say the old me that was talking a lot and that liked to argue and that liked ideas. And there was another part that was watching that part, like just with its eyes open and neutrally judging. And the part that was neutrally judging was watching the part that was talking and going, that isn't your idea. You don't really believe that. You don't really know what you're talking about. That isn't true. And I thought, hmm, that's really interesting. So now I've, and that was happening to like 95% of what I was saying. And so then I didn't really know what to do. I thought, okay, this is strange. So maybe I've, I've fragmented and that's just not a good thing at all. I mean, it wasn't like I was hearing voices or anything like that. I mean, it wasn't like that. It was, it was, well, people have multiple parts. So then I had a, this weird conundrum. It was like, well, which of these two things are me? Is it the part that's listening and saying, no, that's rubbish, that's a lie, that's... You're doing that to impress people, you're just trying to win the argument, you know. Was that me, or was the part that was going about my normal verbal business me? And I didn't know, but I decided I would go with the critic. And then what I d tried to do, what I learned to do, I think, was to stop saying things that made me weak. And now that, I mean, I'm still trying to do that because I'm always feeling when I talk, whether or not the words that I'm saying are either making me align or making me come apart. 
And I think the alignment, I really do think the alignment is, is, I think alignment is the right way of conceptualizing it because I think if you say things that are as true as you can say them, let's say, then they come up, they come out of the depths inside of you. Because we don't know where thoughts come from. We don't know how far down into your substructure the thoughts emerge. We don't know what processes of physiological alignment are necessary for you to speak from the core of your being. We don't understand any of that. We don't even conceptualize that, but I believe that you can feel that. And I learned some of that from reading Carl Rogers, by the way, who's a great clinician, uh, because he talked about mental health in part as a coherence between the, 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 the spiritual or the, or the abstract and the physical, that the two things were aligned. And, and there's a lot of idea of alignment in, in psychoanalytic and clinical thinking. But anyways, I decided that I would start practicing not saying things that would make me weak and what happened was that I had to stop saying almost everything that I was saying. I would say 95% of it. It's a hell of a shock to wake up and, and I mean, this was over a few months, but it's, it's a hell of a shock to wake up and realize that you're mostly dead wood. It's a shock. You know, and you might think, well, do you really want all of that to burn off? It's like, well, there's nothing left but a little husk, 5% of you. It's like, well, if that 5% is solid, then maybe that's exactly what you want to have happen.